Hi everybody, my name is Amanda Noble. I am the Manager of Research and Evaluation at Covenant House Toronto, as well as an Assistant Professor Status Only at the University of Toronto. My name is Benjamin Owens and I'm a Research and Evaluation Coordinator at Covenant House Toronto. And we're gonna share the results of a study we did called the impact of the COVID pandemic on youth experiencing homelessness, shifting to a collaborative prevention focused response in a large urban setting. So the study was graciously funded by Making the Shift Center of Excellence, and there are three objectives. The first one is to understand the impact the pandemic had on youth experiencing homelessness in Toronto. The second, to identify the ways in which the sector collaborated during the pandemic, as well as to strengthen collaboration in the future. And third, to identify recommendations to shift the response to youth homelessness in Toronto to a prevention focused one. In terms of the methodology, we utilize a sequential mixed method design where we started by doing qualitative interviews and we used the findings of those to develop a survey which was later administered to both staff and young people. We collected data at four shelters as well as a hotel and ended up doing 45 interviews with young people, 31 with staff, six with other stakeholders. And once the data was cleaned, our final sample size for the survey uh, for staff was 93 and for young people, 77. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ben to talk about the impacts of the pandemic on young people. So compared to before the pandemic, uh, young people in our sample experienced difficulty accessing a variety of basic needs. Um, over half found it harder to access stable housing and many reported experiencing difficulties accessing food and services. Um, female identified and non-binary respondents were significantly more likely to experience difficulties accessing uh, most of these basic needs. And this quote on the right, uh, explain some of the difficulty finding shelter space uh, due to health and safety protocols and reduced capacity during the pandemic. Uh, this young person says it was not easy, I can tell you that, just getting in and trying to find a bed because they're really so cautious. Young people also experienced difficulty finding and keeping employment during the pandemic. Um, the pandemic greatly impacted many sectors of the economy, uh, particularly where young people work. And 41% of survey respondents uh, in our sample uh, had been laid off during the pandemic. And of those employed, uh, it was often in highly precarious work, including in the gig economy. Um, the experiences of finding and keeping a job uh, during the pandemic also varied by racialization. Uh, survey respondents who identified as people of color were significantly more likely to experience difficulty finding and keeping a job. And interview respondents uh, shared experiences of discrimination in the labor market that uh, helped to contextualize some of these findings. The pandemic also greatly impacted uh, the daily life and routines of young people in our samples. Um, so the two most common changes had to do with sleep and boredom. Uh, over a quarter of interview and survey respondents described uh, sleep irregularities, including staying up all night, and sleeping through the day. And boredom was also common when uh, folks had little to fill their days with. And this was also intimately connected to uh, the mental health of, of interview participants, as well as led to isolation. Um, so yeah, isolation was another significant impact on youth and uh, nearly two thirds of interview participants described how the pandemic limited their social lives, uh, including their ability to see friends and family. Um, a big driver of this isolation were the health and safety protocols that were implemented to slow the spread of COVID-19, uh, which saw the closure of common spaces and, as well as uh, the temporary um, reduction of services that uh, brought folks together. So one of the associated impacts of all of these changes were poor mental health outcomes. Um, this graph on the left illustrates how a third of survey respondents shared that their mental health worsened over the course of the pandemic. And um, this was closely related to these disrupted routines and experiences of isolation uh, and led to an exacerbation of existing mental health issues, as well as a general increase in poor mental health among uh, young people in our sample, uh, particularly anxiety and depression. Um, this also co-occurred with a reduction to in-person services. Uh, as this quote says on the right, um, folks lost access to resources and programming, which this staff member identifies as a cause of poor mental health. Um, so for some youth, substance use was a method for coping with the pandemic and some of the associated mental health impacts. And this quote from a staff member um, says, uh, people got bored and people needed to self-medicate so they would use substances more. Um, and this coincided with a reduction in access to harm reduction services. Uh, so about, uh, nearly a quarter of survey respondents reported that it was harder to access harm reduction services uh, because of COVID-19. It's also really important to discuss the impacts of the pandemic on young people who identify as Black. Um, 
The pandemic was the backdrop to the murder of George Floyd, as well as other acts of police brutality and murder. And in our interviews with Black staff and youth, these co-occurring events brought up traumatic experiences. And also uh, these experiences were not also, uh, always properly acknowledged by social service agencies who were often fixated on the pandemic response. In the words of one young person, COVID took precedence while social justice issues were swept under the rug. Um, additionally, um, as folks were being told to spend more time outside during the pandemic, um, interview participants shared how access to public spaces was not uh, evenly distributed. Um, so this quote from a staff member uh, says, do you understand what it is to hang out if you're a young black man? You can't just sit somewhere and loiter. That's what they call it. It's not chilling, it's loitering. So I also wanna to touch on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on staff. While the majority, uh, vast majority of survey respondents felt that they had adequate access to PPE and testing and information, uh, three quarters felt that they were at risk of contracting the virus at work and bringing it home to their families. And this was particularly felt by frontline workers. Um, but despite this, uh, as you can see in the graph on the right here, um, when asked if they felt that their agency did everything it could to, uh, in response to COVID-19, the majority did agree with that statement. Um, burnout and exhaustion were also prevalent in the staff samples and using data from a validated scale, just over half of survey respondents experienced burnout during the pandemic, which is a striking statistic that was more common among staff who had worked at the agency for more than a year. And the cause of this burnout as told by interview participants concerned a variety of things, including heightened work demands, uh, health and safety concerns, and concerns for clients' well-being. And this quote from a manager on the right says uh, it, that working during the pandemic was kind of like operating in intense crisis mode for way more of an extended period of time than anyone is really supposed to. And related to these professional impacts, but also to the personal impacts that folks were feeling because of the pandemic uh, were mental health impacts on staff. Um, so nearly half of uh, staff who were surveyed said that their mental health got worse over the pandemic. And staff also shared how access to employer provided supports were inconsistent and often symbolic rather than material. Um, so this quote from a staff member on the right says, um, the folks who've been here since March, they need a break. And that means bring in a whole new crew and give them a whole week off. That's what I mean by meaningful support. So I'm going to throw it back to Amanda to talk about collaboration. So the amount of collaboration increased during the pandemic, and this was both cross and intersectional um, amongst the youth shelter system. So for instance, there was increased collaboration between the health and the shelter sector, and also amongst the youth shelters themselves. So while there's always been some degree of communication across the sector, so for instance, there's the YSIN group, which is the youth shelter interagency network. Um, they currently don't work as a system of care or have shared service models. And when the pandemic struck, the city of Toronto uh, put up several hotels so that to accommodate social distancing and what ended up happening was for um, a youth specific shelter a hotel was put up and youth from four different shelters were placed in this hotel so that meant that a new type of collaboration which um, included systems and policies and procedures to ensure a, a consistent level of programming was provided for the young people so in the survey, we asked staff using a validated scale about the state of collaboration in Toronto in order to gauge whether this new model was sustainable. Um, and 70% felt like the state of collaboration in Toronto is sort of in a borderline position. So while there is some communication and collaboration, there's still a long way to go. 28% um, felt like it was very good, the state of collaboration, and 2.2% feel concerned by the lack of collaboration in Toronto. But when you break down some of the scale items, a few interesting findings emerge. So for instance, only 15% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that youth workers in different organizations trust each other, and almost 70% felt that their role would be easier if collaboration was increased. In terms of the response to youth homelessness in Toronto, it was very clear from many participants that there was a desire for to change how things were being done. Um, so I'm gonna share two quotes with you that illustrate this. The first one is, the entire system can be improved. You know, the prevention work, housing first for youth, ensuring emergency services aligned with prevention and diversion, reconnecting people to their communities and families and having the right housing options. Another person talked about coordinated access, which is a system in which uh, people are prioritized for housing and how this can uh, disadvantage young people just by virtue of their age and their needs. Um, so chronically homeless have been prioritized for housing. Yes, we have to help the people in the worst situations, but sometimes this leads to worse situations resulting because they haven't been prioritized and that young people in general should be prioritized. 
when we asked staff for ideas of how to prevent youth homelessness, um, almost half talked about family supports, and it was often contextualized within broader uh, systemic and structural factors. So the quote on the right here says, recognizing that a young person is struggling in the family home because of issues that are much bigger. There are lots of structural systemic factors that trickle down to the day-to-day -day interactions between young people and their family members. Almost 40% talked about improving various systems, and in particular, this was true for the mental health system as well as child welfare. 30% um, talked about school-based services, so intervening while young people were still in school. Um, almost 40% talked about the need for affordable housing, and 20% talked about income supports. We also asked young people um, in the interviews what they thought might have helped prevent their situation. Um, quite a few youth had trouble articulating this, um, but amongst those that did, 44% uh, talked about affordable housing as being key, 27% uh, family support. So the quote on the right here says, you have to think about one of the biggest causes of youth homelessness, dysfunctional family relationships. That's what it usually boils down to. Um, interestingly, about a third talked about it being hard to prevent or not possible. Um, and several of these young people talked about the importance of individual responsibility in being able to get away from the situation of homelessness. 16% um, talked about life skills. And we also asked young people in the survey what they thought might have helped. And we described some of these programs here on the left. Um, and the percentages here reflect those that thought it would be either very helpful or helpful. Um, the most common intervention that was ranked as helpful was housing workers at 61%, followed by financial assistance. Um, and this was particularly for those leaving systems such as child welfare and corrections. Um, and then almost half talked about how the housing first model would have helped them as well as host homes or having a place of respite in the community. Um, and, all, and half talked about the importance of mental health supports as well. We asked young people in both the interviews and the survey what their housing preference model would be um, when they left the hotel or the shelter. And in the interviews, um, it was almost unanimous that they wanted their own apartment um, that was subsidized. It was just what varied was the amount of staff involvement. So half wanted no staff involvement um, and 36% wanted staff around once a week. And another 7.5% said that they would prefer the traditional congregate transitional housing model. Um, so from these findings, we split up um, this in the survey, whether their housing preference and the amount of staff contact that they would have. And we found similar response um, results. So 57% uh, wanted their own apartment with a subsidy. Another 12% wanted their own apartment with no subsidy. Um, in the survey, 25%, so there was an increase in that, uh, wanted the transitional congregate housing model. And in terms of staff support, it was tied for uh, those who wanted staff on call as needed at 29%, as well as those available once a week. 18% um, wanted no staff involvement at all, and 17% wanted staff available 24-7. When we asked participants about what are the major barriers to collaboration and prevention in Toronto, the, the main themes that emerged were there's a history of silos and independence working in Toronto. Um, the city is currently mired in crisis, so there are about 10,000 uh, people who experience homelessness in the shelter system on any given night, um, a thousand of which are youth. There's currently a lack of funding to support prevention um, and funding that is available is generally siloed for one issue when homelessness is a, a fusion issue. Um, it was also talked about how there's multiple stakeholders and systems involved in preventing youth homelessness and bringing them together is very difficult. There's currently a lack of information um, sharing and data sharing in Toronto, and there is a need for more senior government support. So the quote here on the right really talks about the state uh, that this sector is in in Toronto. So homelessness serving organizations, we don't tend to shift our lens to thinking that early on. Our lens is picking up the pieces after things have fallen apart. So finally, uh, the key takeaways that we've found from the study, the first is really the need to balance health and safety with a need for in-person supports and services. So while there was an increase in acuity of need for um, supports, there was, this was met with a decrease in services. So the shift to virtual services can disadvantage some of the most marginalized, particularly those with acute mental health issues, uh, developmental disabilities, or anyone that doesn't have access to technology or private space. And really the majority of the impacts that we talked about today are not new, but the pandemic has only served to amplify them. So with the uh, exception of changes to daily routines, um, young people have experienced mental health concerns, barriers to employment and housing, isolation, um, 
as long as the issue has been around. And so the pandemic really just served to amplify these and make a, a bad situation worse. There is a stark lack of research and identify identity specific services for black youth in Toronto. And this is despite the disproportionate representation. Staff were also extremely um, impacted by the pandemic and this has an impact on young people as well. Organizations and coalitions in Toronto know that there is a need to move from crisis mitigation and to work as a system, but largely don't know where to start and are so overwhelmed by the crisis state that we're currently in. And finally, it's our hope that the pandemic could be seen as an opportunity to shift the response. And so many of the public health measures that were um, taken to keep us safe are not just simply not available to people who are experiencing homelessness. So stay at home orders, social distancing. And it's our hope that the pandemic can really serve as a uh, fuel to uh, shift the response to youth homelessness in Toronto. Oh, and thank you everybody. And this is this my email if anyone's interested in contacting me, um, as well as just a shout out to all of our partners, funders and collaborators.